Yes, please. بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم اللهم افتح علينا فتوح العارفين ووافقنا توفيق الصالحين وانفعنا بالقرآن والذكر الحكيم اللهم انفعنا بما علمتنا وعلمنا بما ينفعنا وزدنا علما يقربنا منك برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم لا سهل إلا ما جعلته سهلا ويا خي يا قيوم تجعل الحزن إذا شئت سهلا سهلا اللهم عيدنا من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أمالنا وصلح لنا شأننا كله لا إله إلا أنت نستغفرك ونتوب إليك اللهم سبحانك لا علم لنا إلا ما علمتنا إنك أنت العليم الحكيم وصلى الله سيدنا محمد وآله وصحبه وسلم وبعد Topic today is about jinns and psychosis and black magic and possession and stuff like that. Allah. Um, I mean, first of all, I think by this way of introduction, it's worth mentioning, as uh, Imam al-Ghazali points out, you know, um, we've, we don't have much knowledge about the soul. Um, the Prophet ﷺ was asked three questions. Uh, the, the Quraysh, you know, when they, when they went to the Jews, and they told the Jews about this person is claiming to be a prophet. What should we do? And the Jews, the learned people of the Jews, they said to the Quraysh, go to the go to this man and ask him three questions. Because only a true prophet could answer these three questions. So the, the Quraysh they went and asked the Prophet ﷺ three questions. And uh, one of them was about uh, the people of the cave, one of them was about Dul Karnain. Um, and one of them was about the soul. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered these questions in, uh, two of them were answered in Surah Al-Kahf, and the other one was answered uh, in a different surah, and that was the one about the soul. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem, wa yasalunaka anir ruh, qul ar ruh min amri rabbi, wa ma uti tum min al ilmi illa qalila, they ask you about the soul, the ruh. Say to them, the soul is from the affair of my Lord, and you have only been given little knowledge about it. You have only been given a small amount of knowledge regarding the soul. So this ayah of Quran has basically limited uh, any any degree of human knowledge that we can ever have. In other words, a human being can never have more than a small knowledge about the soul, the human soul. The reason why I mentioned this to begin with is because uh, when we start talking about things like jinn spirits, black magic, um, jinn possession, and also psychosis and these sort of things, um, to some extent, we, we, we're dealing with uh, the realm of the soul. And in the talk today, I may not give uh, all the answers. I may, I may give more questions or I may raise some points for reflection. So hopefully people won't find that frustrating, but sympathize with me. And one of, part of the reason for that is because we just don't have as human beings, the Quran is limited. We can never have much knowledge about the soul and the spiritual realm. So therefore, our understanding of all of these related areas is always going to be limited. Um, so obviously when we're talking about psychiatry and Western biomedicine, uh, this is based upon a secular scientific worldview and there's no place for metaphysical considerations. I mean, in the West, um, the West uh, following the Enlightenment, the Enlightenment scholars were all discussing metaphysics uh, following the ancient Greeks. But after another century, the Western world had moved on um, from metaphysics and 
basically it was discarded you know that uh, we just we just don't have any uh, metaphysics are just not something that we go into because you can never get to any truths about it so they went into what uh, one sociologist called a positivist uh, positivist state stage which is where we no longer even inquire about metaphysics um, and positivism is all about practical science, empirical science, things that we can observe and so on. So, you know, around about that time, amongst the intellectuals in the West, around about the um, 19th century, coming towards the end of the 19th century, um, basically that, that, that metaphysical realm had disappeared. Uh, so met meta by metaphysical, we mean outside of the physical, outside of the observable physical material realm. Um, uh, however, in our tradition, the Quran begins, the very first ayah, as Alif Lam Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب فيه هدى للمتقين الذين يؤمنون بالغيب ويقيمون الصلاة the Quran is a guidance for those they believe in the unseen. So um, our worldview is different to the Western worldview. We believe in an unseen. Do we believe in the unseen realm, the metaphysical realm? So therefore, when we talk about these things like jinn, uh, we believe in them as we believe in angels, as we believe ultimately that there's a God. Oh, oh, bear with me, I'm gonna, I've got some like uh, moving graphics in these slides because I think for some reason at the point where I created these slides a few years ago, I just discovered how to use PowerPoint moving graphics. So I think I got a little bit carried away. Uh, so this one was about the evil eye. So just play it again. The evil eye is true. al ainu haq was um, a saying of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we believe in the evil eye. The Quran also alludes to the evil eye, not mentioning it overtly, but it's um, sort of mentioned almost, almost overtly in uh, Surah Yusuf, uh, where the father of Yusuf, Yaqub Alayhi Salam, he sends his sons to some a journey and he says to them, when you come to the city, don't all of you go in through the same gate to the city because he had 12 sons and he, he was sending 10 of them on this journey. And if people see all 10 of them together, they, they might get evil eye, you know, like so people see, well, so he's, you know, this is a big, you know, 10 sons is something that people would be proud of in those days. So the commentators in the Quran, they say the reason why he told them don't all go through the same gate is because he was worried that they may get evil eye. So we believe in the evil eye for that reason. Um, and the Prophet said it's true. So the evil eye is um, something that um, is sort of linked to um, jealousy and hasad. And it can uh, be given by anyone, to anyone really. Um, it, it's, not, it's not always done maliciously. Some people can give evil eye without wanting to or without uh, having any bad intention. So that's why we always have to say, MashaAllah, MashaAllah, whenever you see anything, uh, like you know, children or anything that's um, impressive or anything that is good, uh, with someone, you should always say Masha Allah. The ulama said you should even say it to yourself because you can even give yourself the evil eye. So if you um, look in your reflection in the mirror and you feel happy about what you see, you should say Masha Allah. And um, so that so you have to be yeah. That, that's how we. If you say Masha Allah, you prevent the evil eye. Um, the evil eye, as I said, um, it can cause, I mean, so 
there's a certain thing which is from Islam and there's certain things which are from just our wider sort of uh, learning and culture and tradition. So the stuff that's from Islam, I've basically told you. Now there's other stuff which is maybe from weaker hadith or from ulama afterwards. So things like the effects of evil eye are normally thought to be uh, physical, can often be physical health effects. So for example, I had a, there was a famous sheikh in Damascus when I was there. He was one of the most senior uh, ulama in, in uh, Damascus in uh, between about year 2000 to 2005 when I was studying there. And he was very elderly by that time. He wasn't really teaching uh, much, but uh, because he was um, in his, you know, elderly. But obviously he was highly respected by everyone, you know. Uh, thousands of people would uh, go to see him and, and get the barakah and dua and if they could even study something with him, you know, um, they would have, that would be a great blessing. I also went to visit him uh, as well to get the blessing and ask for his ijaz and things like that. He basically was paralyzed, you know, towards the end of his life. He was, I think, in a wheelchair. And um, he, he used to say that he knows he, he got the, the aim, you know, the evil eye on him because he said he, he knew when it happened, it was in one of his classes. And he said there was a female student with niqab and he she actually looked at him and he actually saw he i think he saw something flash towards him and then he just collapsed and from then on he was paralyzed so he was convinced it was evil eye now obviously from a from a medical point of view we may we may think that he may be had a stroke um so a lot on him that's not necessarily mutually exclusive as well. Um, if the evil eye can cause um, physical effects, uh, you know? so that's the type of thing uh, is thought that the evil eye can cause. And um, interesting, an interesting anecdote that uh, one of my uh, fellow uh, colleagues who also studied in uh, um, Islam and uh, trained to be a scholar, he studied the Maliki Madhab in Mauritania, and uh, he told me that in the Maliki books of fiqh, they actually say, you know, because some people are really prone to giving the evil eye. Um, so maybe through no fault of their own, but there's certain, uh, they tend to be women, no, 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 uh, not being sexist or anything, but apparently they tend to be women. And um, they are especially prone to giving evil eye to people. And um, so he said that in the Maliki fiqh, they said, if you have these type of women, and uh, the, the scholars actually recommended that they you should take them out for jihad. And so they're taken with the army, and the Muslim army, and they're put right at the front. So when they look at the other enemy, they, they can uh, cast evil eye on them. I thought that was very interesting and funny. Um, so that's evil eye. Um, it's not, as far as I know, anything to do with jinn. Uh, the effect of it is not mediated through jinn. Unlike black magic, which we're going to talk about later, which is thought to be mediated through jinn, the evil eye is some sort of um, metaphysical effect of its own. But uh, people like Ibn Tayyib al uh, they write about it in, this is in English, you know, prophetic medicine, so-called prophetic medicine that I talked about in the first class, but uh, it is dealt with in those type of books, so people can find that even in English on PDF uh, to a section on evil eye. So have a look at that. But as far as I remember, he talks about how basically you can protect against the effects of the evil eye by what you would expect, you know, doing your daily prayers and your Quran and dhikr and all of those du'as uh, that you do on a regular basis will protect someone from evil eye. So. Yeah, have, have a look at that if you want to uh, find out more. So that's just what it was just one ayah, but obviously the jinn are mentioned in more than one ayah in the Quran. So that's why we believe in the jinn. What about black magic? This is an ayah, the famous ayah of black magic. Okay. 
So the, the, the eye of black magic, um, So these two, these two angels, Harut and Marut, were given this knowledge and they taught it to human beings, but they were forbidden to learn it. So it was like a test that Allah, he made this available, but the, the people were told this is something that is forbidden knowledge. You're not, you shouldn't study it. But if there's those people that chose to um, go against the command of Allah, they learned this uh, magic from these two angels, Harut and Marut. And the Quran says, uh, By using black magic, they were able to split up between man and wife. Immediately after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us the effects of black magic or some of the possible effects of black magic, he tells us immediately that they cannot harm anyone with it except by the permission of Allah. And that's important because we have to not become paranoid and scared about these type of things. Obviously, these, these can be quite scary things because they seem to be outside of our control there. If people can just do this type of magic and make husband and wife split up and do all these uh, things, what can we do about it, you know? But Allah says, وَمَا هُمْ بِضَارِينَ بِهِ مِنْ أَحَدٍ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ They cannot harm anyone with the magic except with Allah's permission. In other words, just like everything, nothing can happen without Allah's permission. So ultimately, everything is uh, from the decree of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, you could get heart disease, you could get diabetes, you could get uh, cancer, you could get black magic. Um, all of these things come within the things that Allah may decree as a test for us. Um, but once again, people like Ibn Qayyim and the ulama, they said that we can protect ourselves from these things by making sure that we do our daily uh, Quran, our daily um, five daily prayers. But very importantly, there's certain, um, there's certain dhikr that you can do every day. Uh, which is what we call wird, which is like a daily, daily wird, a daily uh, zikr that you do, which are usually uh, contain a lot of dua for protection. So I do advise everyone, you know, you, only, you can get some very short one, like 10 minutes, 15 minutes, it takes only in a day, and just do it anytime during the day. Like the Ratib al Haddad is a good one, it's composed of all du'as from the sunnah, from the hadith, from the Prophet وسلم, that protect you and your families and it's all brought together in one, uh, you know, uh, one uh, word and you can just recite that every day after Fajr prayer or after any prayer that you want to and inshallah that's a very powerful protection against these type of things. But yeah, so we believe in magic because the Quran is obviously quite clear about it and then obviously the other thing that we know that you can do through magic is create uh, illusions because that's what the Fir'aun, uh, the, the, the magicians did with Fir'aun. You know, they were able to bewitch people's eyes, in other words. You can bewitch the eyes of people to make them think they're seeing something that they're not seeing. So when those uh, magicians, they threw down the, the thing, they made, they bewitched the eyes of the people. That's what it, the Quran says. They didn't actually make the, the things turn into snakes, but they bewitched the eyes of the people. So the people thought that they were seeing something, but they weren't. So it's a type of hallucination, I guess. And, uh, but when Musa Islam threw down his staff, it actually turned into a serpent. It wasn't an illusion, his one. And his serpent actually ate up the, 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 the staffs that the magicians had thrown down. Now the magicians, because they were the experts in that field, they knew immediately that what Musa has done is not magic. Because they were the ones who were the masters of magic and bewitching, creating these uh, illusions for people. 
But they knew straight away that Musa, what Musa has done is not magic. This is something completely different. So that's why then the magicians were the first to, uh, to take Shahada and, and become, they immediately accepted. They said, we believe in the God of Mo Moses. But Pharaoh remained stubborn and uh, did not accept, even though the, the magicians themselves had uh, become uh, uh, Muslim. So we know these are the type of effects of black magic that's from the Quran. There's also in the Sira, there's an incident in which uh, some magic was done against the Prophet Sallallahu And uh, it is said in the Sira that uh, so, so the person, the people who had got, they had managed to get hold of a hair of the Prophet Sallallahu So one of the methods of black magic is to get the hair of someone and you tie knots in the person's hair and you recite this magical verses and then you blow upon the knots of the hair and that then the black magic has an effect. So that's why the surah says, I mean, Sharin nafatha fil uqad. And nafatha, and nafatha is the one that blows and uqad are knots. So literally, uh, the, the, the ones who blow upon knots. Uh, and nafathati fil uqad. And nafatha is an intensive uh, uh, verbal form like alama, nafatha. And nafathat is the plural of nafatha. So like alama, alamat is a plural. So and nafatha is like intensive. They, they blow, 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 blow. Uh, upon the knots. So the Prophet had, uh, and according to the seerah, now I don't know how strong, but I, I do believe they are quite strong. So the, some of the accounts I believe are in uh, the books of Sahih, uh, that the Prophet affected his, it affected his mental state, uh, the magic that was done on him, to the point where once again he started hallucinating or things like that. And um, then Jibreel alayhi salam was sent down and he gave him the Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq and Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas. And when he recited these two surahs, then he was cured of that magic. So these are two of the most powerful uh, du'as that we have, you know, Qul a'udhu bi rabbil falaq and Qul a'udhu bi rabbil nas, of course, to protect us from these type of things. So these are the type of effects, you know, so splitting up between man and wife. Uh, if people, you know, the magic, bewitching people's, creating illusions, affecting the mental states. And finally, we come to jinn possession. Now, the reason why I have drawn these circles like this also is for a reason, because the evil eye circle is separate. It doesn't overlap. As I said, uh, the understanding of evil eye is not mediated through jinn, as far as I understand. But with the black magic and the jinn and the jinn possession, they, these circles all overlap. Uh, because the black magic is thought to be mediated through jinn. Um, once again, this is um, not from the examples that we've given from the Quran and the Sirah, but this has come in later on, I believe the understanding from ulama that, and, and once again, they may have, the Muslims may have taken this from uh, previous um, teachings, um, because obviously the Muslims took a lot from the Greek uh, medicine. They took a lot from the Christian, uh, um, you know, the Christian uh, traditions. But anyway, so in the books, they mentioned that the black magic is, is often mediated through jinn. So, if someone has magic on them, in, the, in some of the books I mentioned, a lot of physical ailments can be um, caused through magic, and they're often caused through jinn, uh, being literally going inside the body and, and, and being, like for example, if someone's got, say, uh, uh, a bladder problem, there's literally a jinn sitting inside the bladder uh, that is causing that problem. 
Um, so I think these ideas have crept in a bit later on. And um, I'm not very sure about those type of um, ideas. Because you see that a lot in the uh, medieval Christian writings as well, like these demons causing all of these physical and uh, the Christians were very much into um, exorcism of demons because it goes, it's in the Bible, Jesus casting out the demons. Um, so then we come to jinn possession as well. Um, so I think I've talked about before um, to some extent, but uh, jinn possession, now obviously we've already said we believe in jinns, and the Quran tells us that the, the jinns, they can, the shayateen, shayateen are bad jinns. You can also have good jinns as well. But the bad jinns are called shayateen. And uh, so these shayateen, like we know that every person has a shaitan that is uh, accompanying them all the time. And so what the shaitan does is obviously try to uh, get you to do bad things. And it can do that by whispering straight into the heart and what's worse is khannas so what's worse is the whisper and khannas is withdrawing so the prophet has literally described it like he, he inserts his snout into the heart whispers and then withdraws and that's the meaning of what's worse in khannas khannas is the one that withdraws uh, it's from the uh, root Arabic term of the animal in the desert, which in, when the, the sun comes out, the animal runs into the hole. Khanisa. Uh, so khannas, once again, the, the intensive form, like alama khannas. It's an intensive form. So we know that jinns can have access to our, what we would call now mind or psyche, but we can call it heart or soul as well in our tradition. They have access, they can put in bad thoughts, they can put in bad ideas. Uh, once again, one, we can protect ourselves from these evil influences by the more we purify our hearts, uh, the more they will be protected from the evil influences. And the more our hearts are blackened, the more we become susceptible to evil influences. But can jinn actually possess the human being, meaning can they completely overtake the consciousness of the human being? So you have a different consciousness, a different being actually taking over and then speaking and acting instead of the actual human being himself uh, speaking and acting. Um, this, I personally feel, is a little bit more debatable. Um, I have spent, obviously, it's, it is of interest to me, it's, it's my field, so I've spent many, many years thinking about it, and I've also accompanied um, Raqi, a uh, person who does jinn exorcisms, a Muslim Raqi, who does jinn exorcisms. I've seen them done, I've seen jinn possession taking place, and uh, observed it myself, and... Um, I, I st I'm still not convinced uh, about it completely, um, to be honest. I think there is definitely something going on. There's definitely, I mean, jinn jin are there, you know, we know jinn we know jin are around. And um, if you start sort of calling them up and, and uh, start talking to them, you know, you, so um, I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. Uh, oh, actually, I'm talking about it now. So when you talk about jinn possession, I think we can go to the Islamic sources on one side, and then we can go to cultural, once again, cultural beliefs and practices. Uh, and so I think if you look at the Islamic sources themselves, by that I mean the Quran and the, and the Hadith and so on, I, I personally don't believe that there's a clear evidence there that jinn can possess human beings. Um, there are a couple of ayahs of Quran that people claim or they interpret in that way. Uh, one which says when the touch, the touch of shaitan upon the human being, uh, some interpret that as being jinn possession. Um, 
there's some hadith also um, that people uh, interpret as being a jinn possession. So one of them is the hadith of the woman who had epilepsy. So this woman came to the Prophet وسلم, and she used to have epileptic seizures and she asked him to make dua for her uh, to be better. And he said to her, if you wish, I'll make dua for you to be better. But if you wish to have sabr, uh, it will be a, um, it will be a sort of, uh, it will cleanse your sins. Like any illness that we have, if we have sabr patience, it's actually uh, wiping away our sins. So he said, I can make dua for you or you can have patience with it. And it will be like uh, cleansing you. So then she decided, she said, I will have sabr, Ya Rasulullah. But make dua that I don't, my aura doesn't become uncovered. Because when she used to have sometimes have seizures, sometimes uh, her clothes, you know, would become, her body would become uncovered. So she just make dua that, you know, I don't want to. So she decided to have patience with it, with the illness. Now, some people say that this is um, a case of jinn possession. Uh, but I feel the opposite, actually. For me, this, I believe, I mean, my, uh, my reasoning is that if it actually was jinn possession, then surely the Prophet ﷺ would have exercised that jinn. Uh, why would he say, oh, ha, you know, have, have patience with if it's an evil spirit possessing the person? For me, it's more of an indication that, that the Prophet ﷺ has understood this as a physical Ill illness, i.e. epilepsy. Um, as we know, once again, many of the Christians, their tradition, they very much believe epilepsy is a, a, a demons possessing the human being. And even today, there's fundamentalist Christians. They just, you know, it's hard, you know, they just, they just believe people have epilepsy are just possessed by demons. I've come across these are so-called quite educated, but they're fundamentalist Christians. Um, uh, so yeah, I just, I just, I mean, my thinking is, look, if there was, if if demon possession took place and exorcism, wouldn't we have seen more examples of that in the clear life of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and the Khulafa Rashidun, uh, that people would have been coming to them and they would have been exercising the the, the shaitan and stuff like that. But as I say, I am probably in the minority here. Uh, most of our scholars have accepted and, and they uh, believe that jinn can possess human beings and they do rak rukya and they get rid of those jinns so don't just obviously take my word for it i'm just giving you my thoughts um, and also letting you know that that's why not i mean teachers that i studied with and i respect they do rukya and um, people do seem to have the jinn and they, they they read quran on them and the jinn go away And there's another question. Does anything make what one more susceptible to gin possession? That sort of goes against what I'm saying in a way, because I'm saying that's not, I don't really feel it's, but anyway, if, if there was a thing that makes you more susceptible, once again, uh, people like Ibn Qayyim would say that general, you know, maintaining that general type of um, dhikr, Quran, um, daily prayers and so on. Uh, or protection. Um, I mean, the Quran says, you know, the, Allah said to uh, Iblis, you have no power over my slaves, you know, all you can do is you can whisper to them, you can suggest to them, but you have no power over them. Um, so they don't, they don't have that power, you know, they can't, but um, if some people, for example, invite them in, you know, so people who get involved in, say, black magic or people get involved in uh, what do you call that stuff satanic rituals but worship then i think yes i can see that you know they they the, the human being is that you're actually inviting your what you want them to take over you you want them then then i can see that could become a case of uh jinn possession personally um so i think that that's what i would say you know um, just out of interest, the psychiatrist, uh, which is a journal of the Royal College, ran a feature a special on possession a few years back. 
it's a very um what's the word it's uh, the it's called possession disorder in, in psychiatry and it's a very very less um, used diagnosis um it's a fringe it's almost like a fringe thing you know possession disorder it comes under dissociative disorders but it is there in the icd 11 and the dsm and everything so it is recognized as a part of the dissociative disorder so obviously when people dissociate they lose their own consciousness and and you know they they don't know what's going on which is what you see when when people become possessed by jinn um that there's a different entity speaking acting etc and then when the state ends and the person comes back uh they 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 don't know what's happened they can't remember anything that's happened so they've been dissociated um so that is recognized within psychiatry but as i say in, in british psychiatry you hardly ever ever see that being used as a diagnosis so it's different from psychosis if that makes sense yes it is it is different from psychosis that's i'll come back to that as well um but psychosis as you know is basically hearing voices being delusional or having thought disorder uh, possession disorder is a different there's a different phenomena and i think it's if there is such thing as jinn possession it would be possession disorder would be the thing not not psychosis because um, the jinn possessions i've seen up are, are like that you know you have a person and suddenly there's a jinn is speaking in a different voice is acting in a funny way and then it goes and then the person's back and then they can't often they can't remember what happened while that period when they were possessed so it's it's not psychosis uh, which is a really good point because most people think psychosis is gen possession um then we have uh, I, i've mentioned this book i think on a few occasions so i'll just i won't dwell on it too much majnoon the madman in medieval islamic society is probably one of the best references in english i would say if people want to read further about um how madness in general was understood mental disorders in general were understood in uh, by the muslims um in during the islamic age including um you know things like psychosis and things like that as i've said before the muslim physicians uh throughout the muslim world they considered mental illness to be disorders of the brain uh because they had taken it from the greek medicine the greeks also they considered mental disorders generally to be imbalances within the humors within the brain and so on they did not believe that there was due to spirit possession so muslim physicians all the famous muslim doctors you know ibn sina and all of these um they did not uh believe it was jinn possession but the muslim physicians actually used to uh, they were a bit they were a bit sort of looking down upon that beliefs about jinn possession saying that this is just sort of a superstitious type of uh, thing which i think is interesting as well um the other things the the quran tells us about jinn is that the, uh, he and his tribe see you from where you cannot see them so they can see us but we cannot see them and we cannot see jinn and obviously you know about this qulaud uh, rabbin nas we mentioned that already bad jin and good jin are both mentioned in the quran so you know coming on to psychosis as you mentioned i mean you guys are, are medics so i don't need to but when when i'm giving this talk to non medics you often the the idea of what is psychosis and schizophrenia amongst the lay people is so so uh, is mainly based on hollywood um, so often people think schizophrenia is really like split personality which is not um there is a thing called multiple personality disorder which once again I'll talk about a bit later but people lay people generally think that and when you say psychosis they generally think it means someone goes crazy has anger problems um this is more like what psychosis is um So as you know psychosis is basically a loss of contact with reality 
And uh, schizophrenia is one, obviously one type of psychotic illness. Psychosis may have many different causes. As you know, drug-induced brain tumors, injury, dementia. Uh, schizophrenia is, is, is termed a primary psychotic disorder in the ICD-11. Obviously, things like bipolar, you can also get psychotic. You know, with severe depression, you can get psychotic symptoms. So, so psychosis is basically these three, these three uh, symptoms, delusions, hallucinations, and disordered thoughts and behavior. And then with schizophrenia, obviously you get the negative symptoms. And then another um, feature of chronic schizophrenia that a lot of even psychiatrists often overlook this is that people who have schizophrenia for many years, they also develop a general cognitive decline. And uh, remember schizophrenia was, it was first called dementia precox. Uh, so it's like a premature dementia in other words. So people who have chronic schizophrenia, they get a general cognitive decline. Uh, which can be in the frontal lobe, it can be uh, executive functioning, everything. You know what delusions are, don't need to go into that. Uh, you know what hallucinations are. Predominantly hearing voices, but obviously they can happen in any modality. And then obviously thought disorder, and then the, the actions can be bizarre and disorganized because the thoughts are bizarre and disorganized as well. This is an example of a thought disordered. The points of reflection really are, I've mentioned the first one. Um, are there any instances of jinn possession and exorcism taking place in strong hadith or uh, is during the time of say the Sahaba, Khulafa Rashidun? I haven't found any convincing ones. Um, another interesting thing is that, for example, in England and, and European countries, uh, demon possession was very common in the Middle Ages and in pre-modern times. But nowadays, you hardly ever see it. Now, I've been doing psychiatry for obviously quite a lot, long time. I'm sure Brahman Noor might have some comments as well. But you don't really see that, um, as I said, demon possession. Uh, so that's interesting, you know, because people don't believe in um, spirits and demons anymore here in the West, and you, then you just don't see the thing happening. And multiple personality disorder is really interesting. So multiple personality disorder is that Hollywood, this is what a lot of lay people think is what schizophrenia is, is basically um, I don't know if people have seen these movies like um, Glass and um, there was another one um, with uh, Richard Gere. It's quite an interesting movie, Hollywood movie about this guy. Anyway, in the end, he had multiple personality disorder or something, or he was, fa he was fa feigning it all along or something. Um, but what it is, is... Um, in America, it's quite common. And interestingly, in Britain, you don't see it at all. British psychiatrists generally don't believe in uh, multiple personality disorder. But in the US, it's very common because in, in America, um, you have a lot of these psychoanalysts still, Freudian, Jungian uh, psychoanalysts. You know, everyone has a shrink in, in America. So there's a lot of psychoanalysis there still. So one of, one of the things these psychoanalysts do is that they um, sort of go into people's uh, childhood, early childhood, things like that. And um, one of the things they do, for example, there was a big thing a couple of uh, some years back where they, they were basically taking people back into their childhood and they were, they were saying, you, you might have some repressed memories of abuse. Um, are you sure you've never been like abused, sexually abused, anything like that? And then these people would start saying, actually, I think I, I actually I was abused. And um, so it, then it, would, it became quite a big scandal because a lot of these cases started coming out. And then people started realizing that, you know, a lot of people, innocent people were getting accused. Like they were saying, oh, yeah, my parents abused, sexually abused me when I was a kid. 
but I'd forgotten about it for 20 years until I started going to the therapy and now it's been all brought back out through uh, therapy. Uh, people started realizing that actually um, the therapist had sort of um, induced the idea and uh, a lot of them are not that convincing that actually that abuse happened. So one of the things that the psychoanalysts also do with these patients is they um, they get all these different personalities. So, you know, I'm uh, Sheikh Redouan, for example, but then there's a, another personality. I've got another person called Ali, who's a, I don't know, some uh, Ali who's like a, a cleaner in the masjid. He's got a different name. He's got a different personality. He's got a different uh, history. He's got different. And sometimes when he takes over, I start speaking, I'm Ali now. Uh, so that's a, it's a type of dissociative disorder. So it comes under dissociative disorder. But some of these multiple personalities, they can, go get, they can get like four or five personalities. And then there's, some of them can get silly, like 10, 20 different personalities, all with their own names, their own, back, their own age, their own background, they're, they're completely different personalities with that same person. And then the person switches from one personality to the other, supposedly. In America, these psychotherapists, they, they feel that this is um, people that have suffered from abuse or things like that. And then these personalities have come about, these split or dissociative personalities have come about in a type of defense, a defense against this um, emotional trauma of the abuse. So, it's, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, that the, the analyst, the, the psychologist themselves, it seems to me anyway, uh, that they are somehow suggesting to some of their patients that, you know, is there anyone, is there anyone else inside you? Is there, is there, can you hear a voice? Is there a voice speaking to you inside? Oh yeah, I, I can hear a voice. Oh, does it have a name? Yeah, what's the name? You know, so it's like, suggestibility and things like that and when you're in a sort of um so when you have hypnosis for example hypnosis is very interesting because hypnosis you put the person into a state where they're very suggestible like what well, you know generally people have to <coughs> allow you to hypnotize them but Hypnosis does um, does does exist. I mean, it does happen. So I just, I mean, when I was observing the Rukya as well, I found it quite interesting that there were some similarities between the way the, the Raki does the Rukya and the way the hypnotist works. So when you do, when you try to hypnotize someone, you have to get them to focus on one thing, put themselves into like a passive suggestible state and when the Raki is doing Rukya they sort of are, are getting them to focus on some ayahs of Quran you know repeating certain ayahs of Quran and also possibly putting them into like this passive suggestive state and then the Raki says oh is there a jinn inside speak to me now and then then the jinn starts speaking so Quite interesting um, whether there's any anything there, you know. So they were the points of reflection. That was my last slide. Jazakallah, uh, Sidi, for uh, another um, uh, tour de force in, in, in the subject matter, mashallah. Um, no, largely everything, I think, um, over time, uh, I think probably become the normative state. Um, so about half my patients in patients are, are Muslim. Um, so I, I, the phenomena of, of gym possession, I think seems to be less frequent now than perhaps, you know, even 10, 15 years ago, uh, or, or that's my experience at least. Um, now, the only two things I, I, I'd, I'd mention um, in addition is, I think just that very point on suggestibility um, I think when I was at SHO, again, sort of 10, 10 odd years ago, I did a, a mini literature review and it seemed, you know, some of the early work done on, on gin possession or uh, possession states 
said, you know, the, when you do suggestibility scales, um, they score very highly uh, for, for people who believe that they've uh, been possessed by jinn. And I think that's the interesting thing then. Um, you know, I think I remember um, Sheikh Rashid Skinner up in, um, up in Bradford. So, he, you know, he's, he talks about, you know, racist jinn. So, you know, very uh, partial to certain people, but not, not to other people. Um, but yeah, no, again, uh, I think everything you've said, Alhamdulillah, I mean, I think it's, it's really useful as us, you know, to uh, admit our limited understanding, limited knowledge. Um, and, you know, sometimes in medicine, obviously, we, we try and espouse that we know a lot more than, than we actually do to, to support the patients. But uh, yeah, so Alhamdulillah, and I think um, that humility helps us. And then obviously it helps us try to understand things in a better way for, for our patient group. So I, I always find, you know, ph phenomenology very helpful in, you know, and taking that empathic position with the, with the patients. Um, so Alhamdulillah, Jazakallah. You know, having said all of that about my skepticism, I'll be honest. Um, recently, I've had a, a young Muslim patient who's just seen me privately, you know, from local community. But I've recently thinking he should go and see a Raqi because um, some of the things that he's describing just sounds like a jinn inside him. So, yeah, I'm, you know, that's my, it, that's what I said. We, we might not know all the answers and uh, the way things work within the spiritual realm and with jinn and things like that is a lot of mystery as well around it. So I'm, I'm sure jinn can have effects as well, you know, to different, to different degrees. It's just whether they can completely possess that. That's probably what I would question as well. Uh, Sheikh, I just wanted to, to confirm that, um, when illness expiates your sins, that includes mental illness. Yes, it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Salam, so, Sheikh. Um, uh, I just wanted to ask. Um, I think in our societies, there's a lot of. Um, well, whenever any calamity seems to befall people, they they are quick to sort of say, "Well, it's black magic, or someone's done black magic," and you know that kind of thing. And then a lot of people talk about how they've gone to certain sheikhs or people to, to have the black magic removed or I, i'm not sure what they do exactly or they give them certain verses to read etc uh, could you just say a few words about that because well it's just difficult you know when people come and tell you things and then they say well i've been to such and such a body to be cured and, and that really helped me yeah. etc um, I, I don't know what your thoughts are about when people are going to these other people for, for that kind of help and what, what, what you know about that kind of thing. Yes, I mean, the thing with black magic, obviously, as I say, we cannot deny it. So um, I think it's way over. I mean, it's definitely the case that uh, our people tend to just blame everything on black magic. And there's, um, it sort of externalizes things because say, for example, your child can't get a job or their marriage is broken up or whatever is sort of in a way more comforting to blame it on some external source rather than saying there's something wrong with us, our family, or the way we brought him up, or, you know, um, there, there's that. So people, I think psychologically, it's easier to uh, blame something external. Um, there may be some good people that can uh, uh, um, help with black magic, but a lot of people out there are just obviously charlatans making money and just uh, dodgy, dodgy type of um, people. So it's obviously not a regulated thing, you know. So that's the only problem. If you go to a genuine good alim or a scholar or a sheikh uh, that can give you some Quran or do Rukya, that's that's fine. I mean, and if there is some black magic, inshallah, we'll we'll get rid of it. But um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But the the problem is because there's so many people just taking advantage of people, taking money of people. Uh, things like that is what the main problem is. Um, but if people want to, I mean, people tend to go to these people and then they'll come to a psychiatrist afterwards when that doesn't work or whatever. I mean, in my experience, even those people that come and say to you, oh, yeah, I went to this and it's really helped me and it's, it's miraculously got better. If you go back to that person after six months, uh, nine times out of ten, they've gone back and fallen back into that same problem. Uh, that's been my experience over time. Um, sometimes people get excited, they think things have improved, but 
um, sadly, um, often it's not very long lasting. Brother Noor, did you have your hand up? Uh, yes, no, uh, again. Um, I, th I think my, my question was around, um, is it very interesting for me that obviously in, in fiqh terms, um, you have the three conditions um, to the same responsible adult, uh, so mukallaf. Um, I just wanted uh, your understanding on on that in terms of what was the, when they made that uh, condition, you know, what sort of things did it embody? Because um, I think that's very fascinating that, you know, that that was a very important uh, observation that people would have to be in a sane state to be, you know, yeah. for fit uh, to apply. Yeah, yeah I, I think, I mean, I assume it was basically what we would call today schizophrenia, you know, so that's a sort of typical madman, you know, the, the old, the, the, the sort of village lunatic who goes around disorganized thoughts, muttering nonsense, talking nonsense. Is what we would call um, schizophrenia, I guess. Um, so, I mean, it's basically, um, it's what we would call capacity now, you know, as well. Because obviously there's different degrees of madness. Um, so when are you not mukallaf, when are you not responsible, is obviously, it's a capacity issue. So um, if you're obviously completely out of it, then you're not responsible. But if you're yeah, yeah, so that's uh, what I would say. But the other interesting thing about um, psychosis and schizophrenia is because I did a medical anthropology master's. Um, so it's it, it, there's a lot of cultural psychiatry there, and that was um, looking at different cultures and how they deal with madness and things. It's very interesting um, that, you know, if you, if you look at some very traditional places where they don't have biomedi Western biomedicine still, and, and obviously there's not many places like that left, but the places that have been looked at and have been studied. And it, because there's no one's, no one's really done the research on like if, how to treat schizophrenia uh, outside of the biomedical model and compare that to the biomedical model. Those studies I don't think have been done, but there was one study I came across uh, in which, um, out, because really you have to compare outcomes, long-term outcomes. Like if someone gets schizophrenia, we put them on antipsychotics, uh, you know, whatever we do. But let's say they're treated the traditional way by traditional healing, uh, Rukia, whatever. Really we wanna know what happens five, 10 years down the line. Not what the immediate, that's not that so important. Well, how are they in five years' time, 10 years' time, rest of their life? Um, it's a quite interesting. I mean, the, 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 the one study, and I, I wish I had saved it some, I might have saved it somewhere, the reference for it, um, that was out there, showed that the, the long term outcomes were just as good or even better if you look after these people in that more traditional model. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just. That's an interesting observation. I mean, in psychiatry, generally, we don't make people better. We normally just uh, damage limitation and trying to get them as best as we can uh, with the medication and get their quality of life the best as we can. There's a small minority that can fully get better um, from serious mental illness, but um, yeah, uh, yeah, Madiha? Yeah, yeah, no, sorry, sorry. No, it's just, um, I, I think the study you're referring to, the Dunedin study, it was the international pilot study into schizophrenia. Yeah. I think it was done in 1979. They, they did find that, I think it's something we, we talked about earlier in our previous session around outcomes are better in less developed countries than in more developed countries. And part of it is because obviously the social isolation that you find in uh, more developed countries versus less developed countries where you know, a person with schizophrenia type symptoms actually has a social role. You know, they may be in the zawiya or something like that. They, they have a role. They may be cleaning the masajid and, and things like that. So because our countries make such a big um, impetus on having a sort of employment role um, and, and only if you're employed, are you of any value to society? Obviously, I think that that study did show, obviously, that outcomes are actually poorer in uh, more developed, economically developed countries. Yeah, it'd be good if you can actually, if you can send me that reference, that'd be great.
Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'm always looking for and and the other yeah the other thing related to that was when I done that cultural psychiatry. You know, the, one of the things you see with psych schizophrenics as well, you probably noticed is some of them they really like to just go and wander around. You know, so they're often found in forests. You know, half naked or living in you know living rough, wandering around. And then we just think, oh my God, we need to section them. They're a danger to themselves and others. But in some in some places where you go to the traditional sort of village, you know, in the in the middle of mountains and things, when you get this sort of village madman, often he'll go wandering for two, three days around the forest and by himself, and then he'll come back. And he's free to do that, you know. So there's there's an uh, interesting how we deal with that differently, you know. Might be nice to just let them go and wander around. <laughs>